Welcome to chapter 20, people. Rubba boo. Uh, this is a a mixture of uh, a boiled mixture of flour and dried meat. You know, dried meat, another name for dried meat is what? Yeah, you guessed it. We call it jerky. So you take dried meat and you throw it in a boiling pot of water, throw in some flour, maybe throw in some berries, and you get a mixture called rubba boo. Now another, uh, another name for dried meat, which you might hear them call it, is something called pemmican. Pemmican, about the same thing as beef or as jerky. So chapter 20, rubber boo, they're still at the rendezvous, people. They haven't left to go back home yet. So on the morning of their departure, they're getting ready to, obviously, all five canoes were loaded by 3 a.m. Yikes. Lake Superior still lay still in silver gray. Pierre knew it was important to start early and paddle hard on the big lake in midsummer because violent winds often make travel, often made travel impossible by the early afternoon. As the brigade pushed off from the pier, each voyageur crossed himself, and he whispered a prayer before he took up his paddle. La Petite, choosing not to disturb the mist quiet morning with a song, whistled a soft tune instead. Commander McKay and Emil and the other Evernons had gone north the day before. New hands were hired to replace those excuse me <clears throat> that wouldn't be returning. Goodness gracious. Hello. New hands were hired to replace those that wouldn't be returning. The previous morning, Emil had shaken Pierre's hand before he started up the famous portage and said, Make sure you don't beat up Belly Boy too often. Belly Boy was a nickname Emil had used for Belois since the day Pierre punched the bowman in the stomach. <laughs> I promise, Pierre said, laughing. And you keep your powder dry. Until next year? Emil grinned turning up the trail. We'll see, Pierre called after him. After McKay checked one last bill of lading, he took Pierre aside and said, you listen to Charbonneau and La, La Petite on the, way home, on the way back to Montreal, lad. If you learn as much going home as you did on your outdoor trip, you'll be wintering with us soon. Then McKay reached in his pack and he pulled out a leather-bound book. I thought I'd loan you a bit of reading material to keep you occupied on the way home. So Pierre's eyes widened as he opened the volume to the longest title he'd ever seen. The Journals and Letters of Pierre Gaultier da Varennes da la Varendry and his sons. Pierre had always wanted to read about la Varendry and the most famous of all, the most famous of all French Canadian explorers. Thank you, sir, was all Pierre had a chance to say before McKay waved one last time to the crewman he was leaving behind, and he started up the Grand Portage Trail. Remember, that's the trail we talked about in the, uh, was talked about in that video. It was about eight and a half to nine miles, 300 feet difference in elevation, up, of course, and it was a brutal, brutal portage. Like I said, the Fur Trade Company used to use animals to do it, but it ended up making them lame, and it cost them money to replace the animals. So what they use instead? People. That same afternoon, Mukwa stopped by their camp to say goodbye. The chief embraced Charbonneau, and... Uh, wished him luck on his many days paddle. Then, then, 
Then he turned and he pumped Pierre's arm hard, calling him my friend's friend and saying, you must visit us again soon. Kenoa wishes you a safe journey also. Perhaps you will come next season. Tell her to look for me next June, Pierre replied. Though Pierre would miss this place, he was glad to be heading back to Lachine. When he thought of Kenawa and her straight parted hair and her shy smile, he longed for the gentler pleasures of home, tired of smoke and grease and unwashed men. He was looking forward to simple things such as sitting at a clean table and eating a meal of his mother's roast chicken and blueberry pie, soaking in a tub of hot water and sleeping on the soft ticking of his old bed. As the painted prows swung east, Pierre saw the dark eyes of Kanawa and her quiet lodge up on the hill. He would return to Grand Portage. His first journey was made out of duty to his family. Right? The only reason he went on this trip is because of his dad's crippled hand. But next time he would voyage here on his own account. He'd been thinking a lot about what Mr. McKay had said about tending to his studies. If he could use his schooling to secure a place as an officer of the company someday, that, that would give him the best of both worlds. He could learn and profit and adventure all at once. So one by one the paddlers began their steady dip and pull. So, what do you think of our new boat, Pierre? Charbano asked proudly. Well, it looks narrower than our old one. Oh, you got a good eye for canoes. It's speed we want, and just like the clipper ships back east, trimmer is faster. Well, she's a beauty, Pierre agreed. As he studied the clean new ash of the gunwale, gunnels, Remember that word, G-U-N-W-A-L-S. W-A-L-E-S, excuse me. Pronounced gunnel. Ash is a type of wood. Okay, boys and girls. So we use ash for the top of the gunnels. As he studied the clean new ash of the gunnels, he remembered his father telling him how important it was to pull his own weight. On the route home, he would make up for any weakness He'd shown earlier. I'll paddle as I've never paddled before, he promised himself. Pierre strained with his arms and his shoulders, forward, forgetting that the legs in the back were the key. He pulled hard and fast, forgetting that pace is everything to the canoeman. Soon he'd be forced to catch his breath, and before they cleared the harbor, his muscles ached. Suddenly he was angry with himself. How had he forgotten Lalonde and Charbonneau's advice so soon? When he finally caught the old rhythm, he smiled. Thinking back to his first days on the Ottawa, Pierre soon forgot his paddle altogether, and he cheated his work by, for, by dreaming. Time passed in a blur. The paddling and the pipe stops fell into the familiar pattern as the sun tracked its way across the sky. A western breeze came up by mid-morning and helped push them on. Anxious to take advantage of the conditions, La Petite and Charbonneau kept the rest stops short. Work your blades, boys, one or the other would sing out. When the old lady of the wind smiles, it's a sin not to fly. Scorning the pleasant weather as he scorned all things, Belois was silent. By the early evening, they traveled nearly 70 miles. Wow, that's a lot of miles they put behind them. Then Charbonneau steered his point, his correction, his boat alongside La Petite's and called out, That's Nipigon Point just ahead. 
Should we call it a day? Pierre's heart thrilled at the prospect of rest. Fine with me, Charbonneau, La Petite replied, sculling his oar with practiced ease. Though these fellows haven't pushed the issue, Charbonneau said, motioning with his paddle toward his crewmen, I know they're itching to test the speed of their boat. Pierre turned angrily. He couldn't believe the men would suggest a race after they paddled for 14 hours. I thought maybe you got beatings enough on our first trip to last you all the way back home, La Petite teased. But this is a new canoe. Your men are the same, Charbonneau. Don't kid yourself. The canoe doesn't paddle itself. Then, turning to his crew, La Petite continued, What you say, fellows? Shall we give these amateurs a lesson? A moment later, all five canoes were racing for Nipigon Point. Pierre paddled without enthusiasm. He thought, why not just save your strength for carrying the firewood and for taking the teasing that's sure to follow? It wasn't until they were halfway to shore that Pierre finally became excited about the race. La Petite's canoe was just off their port bow. Okay, in uh, nautical terms, nautical means uh, having to do with ships and boats. Port is the left side of a ship. Starboard is the right side. So if something was off their port bow, it's off the left side. It all depends on... This is in reference to sitting in the ship or boat or canoe in this case. So when you're sitting in the canoe and the port side is going to be the uh, left side. All right, so when you're standing in front of the ship looking at it, it's a different reference. And opening, uh, so anyway, La Petite's canoe was just off their port bow and opening up a half-length lead. Belois turned to check the progress of the other three craft. Pierre assumed that the rear canoes were getting ready to pass them, as they usually did in the middle of a race. But Belois grinned and yelled, Pull, ladies, pull! We buried them. Pierre turned into his astonishment, he saw that their canoe was two lengths ahead of the next one. In this moment of inattention, he splashed the man ahead of him and nearly dropped his paddle in the lake. Paddle up, Page! Charbonneau said and cursed. Pierre whirled his blade. There was their chance to avenge six weeks, six long weeks of losing. As La Petite's canoe pulled ahead by a full length, the big man turned and teased them doffing his cap and waving goodbye as he was about to board, as if he were about to board a fancy carriage. Let's learn them not to celebrate so soon, Charbonneau called. Belwell yelled, yes, yes, as the men pursed their lips and pulled for all they were worth. Charbonneau's canoe closed to half a length and was still gaining when La Petite glanced back, expecting to find a safe distance. Shocked, he took a big sweeping stroke with his steersman's paddle and yelled, Press hard, fellows! Pierre saw that two of La Petite's crew were startled by the sudden shout and missed their strokes. La Petite yelled again, but Charbonneau's men pulled all the faster. Though La Petite won by a paddle length, Pierre was elated to see the final canoe in the brigade still a hundred yards offshore. So what do you think of the new boat now, Pierre? Charbonneau said with a smile as he stepped into the water and turned their craft parallel to the beach so that the middlemen could unload. Well, it's hard to believe that it could be that much faster. It's not all the canoe. When you paddle a bad boat, it builds big muscles. Charbonno squeezed Pierre's biceps and made his eyes grow, go wide. Now we are ready for the races. Charbonno's crew had their canoe unloaded before the last craft arrived. Standing with his arms crossed, Charbonno claimed bragging rights. He waited until the last canoe pulled in, and then he waited still longer. And when all the men were convinced he wasn't going to speak at all, 
He yawned like a man who had been waiting too long in the sun. Uh, could you tell me, gentlemen, he asked, why soup tastes sweeter when it was warmed by another man's wood? Laughter echoed up and down the beach. That evening, Pierre was surprised when Bellegarde made a delicious concoction called Rababu for supper, made from pemmican and flour and a bit of sugar. It was rich in flavor compared to their ordinary ration of salt, pork, and corn. Yuck. Sorry about this. I got to get this stabilized. When Pierre noticed that La Petite had taken a place at the head of the line, he teased him. Well, not only is our famous steersman fast in the water, Pierre said, but he's quick to get at the cooking pot. The crewman laughed. Hush up and eat, La Page, La Petite countered. Well, forgive me, sir, Pierre said, but I am only a poor student learning how to paddle my canoe. As Bellegarde ladled up generous, generous portions of a speciality. The men were quick to show their praise. You are an artiste with the cooking pot, monsieur, Charbonneau said as he watched the greasy little man load his plate. And your intelligence is surpassed only by the quality of the company you keep. Putting it on a bit thick, aren't you, Charbonneau? La Petite called out from across the fire. Well, talent needs praise to flourish. So why don't you tell the truth, La Petite insisted, and admit that you're just happy to see someone else gather the wood for once. Several of the company seconded the, the comment. Besides, Charbonneau, La Petite continued, you forget I wintered with you up on the Red River and... I defy you to. And, La Petite continued, I got plenty sick of your whining about the rancid buffalo fat and rotten service berries that were bagged in the name of pemmican. But this, Charbonneau insisted, is finer and more delicate fare. Anyone can tell. La Petite caught Bellegarde's attention, asking, where was this pemmican made? There was a pause while well, Bellegarde thought. I believe McKay said it came from Pembina. The men, knowing that Pembina was a post in the Red River, instantly burst into laughter. Pierre stared at his plate. The black fibers that he'd assumed were strands of dried buffalo meat looked suspiciously like hair. And he leaned in La Petite's direction and whispered, there ever hair in pemmican? Well, is there water in a lake? Pierre frowned. What sort of hair would it be? La Petite was still catching his breath from his hard laugh. That depends. It might be buffalo, coyote, prairie dog, human. Who knows? Sometimes it might be a mix of several kinds of critters. Pierre looked down at his plate again. He was hungry for something simple, like boiled corn. All right, they're well on their way home. Only a couple more chapters left.